in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corinne Bonnevité, and I'm the marketing manager at ILAC Group. Welcome to our webinar of why combining 22 and ITIL methodologies. You will receive the replay of this webinar by email tomorrow, but please stay until right the end as we have a special offer for you. If you want to see more of our webinars from our subject matter experts, check our YouTube channel by just typing ILX Print 2 in the search bar. Now I'm going to pass you over your presenter, Paul Wigzel. Paul is IT expert and Prince 2 practitioner. Thank you, Paul, and over to you. Thank you, Corinne. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Welcome to this session. Uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes or next half an hour or so talking about um, ITIL and project management, specifically print 2 and why I think they potentially uh, deliver a much better service if you combine the two together. Um, I'm just mindful of the fact that today is um, uh, the 5th of November uh, and therefore we were thinking back to Guy Fawkes and his unsuccessful attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Uh, some I'm sure would argue that this would be a good, good for him to come back and, and do that now. However, it, it, it is interesting I think um, that when you look back and look at history and look how unsuccessful he was and how ultimately he was hung, drawn and quartered, um, it might be a bit of a strain, but, but the thought crossed my mind that if he'd actually used project management and service management combined, um, the outcome might have been very different and our country therefore very different. Um, because when all, all is said and done, to blow up the Houses of Parliament and get caught was actually a very unsuccessful project uh, and therefore we need to think about project management and we need to think about service management and the combination of the two. So let's just touch on a little bit to start with. The first is, uh, the thing I want to highlight straight away is that Prince 2 is a methodology and ITIL is a framework. Now Prince 2 is all about the seven processes and here we can see the seven processes, the startup, the initiation project, IP if you like, controlling a stage, managing stage boundaries, managing product delivery, closing a project and then ongoing throughout the entire project we have directing a project. On the ITIL world we have a framework and that consists of, and you'll notice there I put, it's 20 plus processes um, and they're in five different life cycle phases. Well they are different but they are all interconnected and why are there only 20, why do I say there are 20 plus processes rather than being very specific and saying well there are seven within PRINCE2 and that's because it depends which ITIL expert you talk to. Some will tell you there are 20, some will tell you there's 23, some will tell you there's 26, and so on. Because in the ITIL world, a process is where you've got a set of inputs, activities, and then defined output. And there are some processes um, in the ITIL lifecycle which you could argue quite strongly are just a set of activities, uh, and there is no defined output at the, at the um, entrance to those processes. But, but it's a moot point and one that, one that can be discussed. So that, just to, to put that into to context, I just wanted to, you to be aware that, that that's what we're, we're starting to talk about. We're talking about the framework of uh, the five life cycle uh, phases, the strategy, the design, the transition, the operation, and the continual service improvement. Now, continual service improvement happens all the way through, rather like directing a project happens all the way through. And what we'll see is that service operation is all about the live service and the delivery of the day-to-day uh, services, whereas the strategy, the design, and the transition are all about uh, the formation, the, the detail, uh, the control, and ultimately the deployment of the service into the life cycle, much like PRINCE2, except the big difference, of course, with PRINCE2 is we're very focused upon project, uh, products rather, uh, within the project rather than services within service management. So let's, let's have and move on. So, before we do this, I just want to ask you guys, before we go into PRINCE2 and ITIL in any detail, I'd like to ask you guys if you could answer a question. There's a couple of questions. There's one coming on this slide and there's one coming on the next slide and then we'll leave you in peace to listen for half an hour or so and then we'll ask you another question. So, uh, Maria is about to um, put 
the, the question up to you at the moment. So she's going to ask you a poll. If you could just complete that, that question. So Maria, if you would be able to do that now, that would be fantastic. The question we're going to ask you is, do you currently use Prince2 and ITIL? The answers you're given are either yes, we use both, uh, no, we don't use either, if you like, yes, just Prince, or yes, just ITIL. It's just a, um, I don't get to see, well, I do get to see the answers ultimately. You'll get to see the answers and then uh, Maria will text them to me. So I will type them in so I can see the answers. I'm just curious as to whether we've got a Prince 2 bias, an ITIL bias, a bit of a mixture of, the, the, of all two, or both of them, um, or where it's a combination of. So if you could answer that question, that would be great. So hopefully the, the system is collating those uh, answers as we speak, or as I speak, and as you listen. If you could just pop your answers in, that would be absolutely brilliant. Good. Okay, well, I'll let you do that. And Maria, when they're done, if you could post up those answers for me, that would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Ah, I can see they're coming now. I was going to carry on talking about Prince 2, but I can see they're on their way. So. So, oh, right. so we've got 29% using both, 36% uh, not using either, okay. And now I should be able to do the maths now, but I'm going to be lazy and wait for the result. 19 just prints too. And 15 just idle. Okay, okay, interesting. So we have a, a, a bit of both, um, but that um, I focus more towards project management and less idle. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question in a moment, so just let's just touch on this slide before. Um, you might have seen this before, and I'm sure you have seen this before. If you're into Prince 2, you definitely have seen this before, where you've got the pre-project phase, if you like, which is in startup, and then you've got the initiation phase, uh, where you're setting your stage boundary, doing the initiation, all the work, pulling together the business case, uh, pulling together the issue log and the risk log and the quality logs and so on and so forth and the strategies, uh, the communication strategy and the, the configuration management strategy and all of those good laudable stuff, uh, good laudable things. And then we're into the, the stages and delivering the stages um, and most of all, of course, delivering the products within the stages. So we're talking about teams and we're talking about the project itself, controlling the stages, managing the boundaries. And then ultimately, we end up with closing the projects in the final delivery stage. Now, traditionally, this is where a lot of people think, well, that's where ITIL gets involved. Now, I'm hoping that I'm going to slightly dissuade you of that being the case. Because if we look at, quick change to my, if we look at this, this is the ITIL life cycle. Now, service operation is all about the managing of the day-to-day -day service. No argument. Nobody can argue with that. That's what it does. Service operation is all about the managing of the day-to-day -day services. But you will notice that there is also an area called service strategy. There's one called service design. There's one called service transition. And then there's continual service improvement. Now, I've already said that continual service improvement is happening all the way through, so we can effectively ignore that for now because that's going on constantly. Service operation is all about the day-to-day -day delivery. So we have this element of service design, service strategy, and service transition. So I'm just going to ask you this other question. So this will be the last poll we do until the end of, end of the webinar. So Maria, if you could just please um, put up our second question, because I'm going to ask you uh, ladies and gentlemen who are listening to me, in your view, when does ITIL start and when does PRINCE2 end? Does ITIL come before PRINCE2? Does PRINCE2 pass the projects or the products on to ITIL? Are they just totally separate that there's no link between the two? Or should they or do they work simultaneously? So what's your perception at this point in time, please? see it's quite a few of you now so thank you all for joining I do appreciate uh, 
you finding three quarters of an hour out of your day when I'm sure you're all busy to, to listen to us and to interact with us. It is much appreciated. And there's more people joining. Thank you. Whoever the 94th person was that's just joined, welcome. We're just asking a simple poll. When do you think ITIL starts and PRINCE2 ends at this point, before we get into the, the meat of the presentation? Excellent. So the poll's now closed, so I'm hoping that Maria's just about to put up the um, results for me, just so I can see what your perspective is, and then we'll carry on. And we won't ask you any more questions until the end. I just wanted to to get a, gauge your perception at this point in time. Okay. So 11% 11, 11 think ITO just before Prince. 14 thinks. Prince passes um, passes projects and products through to ITIL. Yeah, nine people, nine percent of you think they're totally separate entities, which means that three. So trying to do the math very quickly before I'm thirty, which is most of you think that they work uh, simultaneously. Good, 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 good. Well, I'm going to hopefully confirm for you sixty-six percent they do work simultaneously, uh, and try and persuade you nine nine percent that think they work separately, that they don't. So, oh, excuse me, let me go back one. This is um, a silly diagram, a silly silly picture, silly slide. But for me, it's quite an important slide because a lot of a lot of you, well, you, you've said, uh, how many you got there? 14% of you think that ITIL is the recipient of products. So the project deliver the product products and they pass them into the service area, the service support area, the ITIL area, and ITIL must catch it and look after it. No, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that logic. So effectively, all we're focusing on is the product delivery, and that's all we do. We do product delivery, and it's uh, ITIL, it's your responsibility to look after it, because you do all the day-to-day -day stuff. Well, from my perspective, I don't see that as being the way it is, because my argument would be, well, if that's the way it is, what you are about to catch, you don't know whether it's going to be a ping pong ball, whether it's going to be a tennis ball, whether it's going to be the size of a basketball. Do you have the people to catch and manage a basketball? It might not be round at all. It might actually be totally weird in shape. It could be heavy. It could be a bowling ball. God forbid it could even be a bomb. It may be ball shaped, but it doesn't mean it's a ball. So. The argument I'm having is that if the people who are supporting it are involved in the product delivery from the outset, then they actually know what it is that they are going to try and catch. So they know whether it's going to be. In fact, probably I should have put a, put a pit. I probably should have put a picture of a turkey on there because it does strike me that an awful lot of time what's passed over the wall is a turkey, isn't it? But if we know what it is that we're catching, if we were involved right at the outset, if we were involved in the reason it's happening, if we were involved in the design, if we were involved in the transition, then hopefully, and with, to be honest, even just a reasonable management, we should be able to support it pretty adequately because we knew what was coming because we were involved. So there are lots of touch points between ITIL and PRINCE2, and there are a couple, and there is only one, two, differences, where they slightly contradict one another. But even that's not that major. In the ITIL world, change management is one of the most powerful processes. I always talk about ITIL having five, the five major processes. Five major processes, problem management, incident management, um, uh, and then you've got change management, and you've got um, service level management, and and to a degree, uh, you might argue that there's business relationship management. But the four biggest ones are service level management, change management, incident, and problem. Change management, one of the most power powerful. In Prince 2, 
obviously you still have change management because change is part of, uh, is a theme in its own right. Change is one of the seven themes. But in Prince2, change management makes changes to the requirements and the products stored within the configuration management system. So effectively, configuration management is the king or the queen, if you like, and change management works to them as the subject. Whereas in ITIL, change management is the more powerful of the processes and uh, it's underpinned by service asset and configuration management and the information is still stored within the configuration management system. No argument with that. But it, so they still have exactly the same premise, if you like, but, but in essence, service asset and configuration management in version 2011 has been slightly downgraded. Um, it used to be on level par with change management. It's now no longer seen as a level par. It activities of change management. So let me get rid of these drawings, otherwise they appear on the next slide. Okay, so there are multiple crossovers, however. So what you do end up with is um, in Prince2, you have a senior user. The senior user sits on the project board. The senior user also gets involved at the end when the products have been delivered and they become the recipient, the owner, if you like, of the products. Well, ITIL recognizes that. They might talk about services rather than, than products, but effectively they have a role called the service owner. Pretty much the same, responsible for the delivery of the service. Senior user, responsible for utilizing the product. Customer is the same. Customer is a customer is a customer. So the customer in Prince2 is the same as the customer in ITIL, the person paying for the project, the person paying for the service. We also have in Prince2 the project executive, the person sitting, if you like, at the top of the project board, the decision maker, the one ultimately decisions uh, are, um, sorry, is ultimately accountable for the decisions, if you like. In the ITIL world, it's a bit less dis distinct than that because they have service strategy. One of the processes within the service strategy is the service portfolio manager. The role of the service portfolio manager is to decide when services should be retired, when services should be developed, Ooh, the start of a project and when services should be transitioned into the live arena, the live, the production environment. So effectively, the, the project exec, in my interpretation, is much the same as the service portfolio manager. The business case is the business case. The big one, if you like, is this done. In the ITIL world, we have what's referred to as the service design package. Now, most of you do print. No, you also have the project's initiation document. To my mind, they are effectively one of the same things. It's about the business case. It's about what you're actually delivering, the project product deliverable, the, product pro the project product description. In the ITIL world, the service design package is, is defined as a collection of documentation containing all information about the business case, what you're going to deliver, how it's going to be delivered, how it needs to be supported. Well, actually, pretty much everything that's in a PID. So when you see the word or the, the acronym PID, if you're an ITIL bloke or a lady, see service design package. Design package, think PID, because in reality they are almost one of the same thing. In fact, as I say, I, I would consider them to be the same. In ITIL we have what's referred to as change evaluation. This is about as close as ITIL ever gets to projects. It talks about understanding what's, what was predicted, understanding the actuals, and making a decision as to whether you should progress any further down the delivery pathway, which is pretty much managing stage boundaries, isn't it? Reporting on what you expected to achieve, reporting on what you did achieve, and asking the project board for permission to continue down the project deliverables. Much the same, I feel, much the same. In Prince 2, we have the follow-on, oh, excuse me, let's go back to where we are. In Prince 2, we have the follow-on um, follow um, actions recommendation report. In ITIL, we have the CSI register. Again, a collection of improvement opportunities in the CSI register, in the follow-on action recommendation, a collection of opportunities or activities that should be um, accepted, taken up, in order to make the deliverable better, for me pretty much one of the same thing. We have the project board, the group of people making a decision, but it's actually the project exec that makes the decision. So the project board enable the project exec to make the decision. In ITIL, we have exactly that called the CAV. The change advisor job is to advise the change authority 
whether, the, whether that should go ahead or not. Now, from a change management perspective, and just to be a bit idle for a second, this is usually considered around um, the production environment, but there is no reason why the service portfolio manager and the change authority couldn't be one of the same person. So the project executive uses the project board in the same way that the change authority uses the change advisory board. And the service portfolio management would use his fellow strategy, sorry, his fellow strategic thinkers. We also have team managers in PRINCE2, and in the ITIL world, we have functions. We are going to talk about those a bit later on, but we have functional units, collections of people with an expertise. Well, if you're a team manager, you're actually running a team with expertise, I believe. So, in truth, I think they're very similar, if not one of the same. And then lastly, we've got the configuration librarian. In ITIL, we have a configuration librarian. In PRINCE, we have a configuration librarian. So one of the same. So there's lots of crossovers and very few differences. So I wanted to try and give a real world example of, of how I see the fact that the two working together. Now, we could have done an IT project, but that seemed a bit silly because we all have different experiences of IT and we all have different um, uh, knowledge around IT. So I thought I'd try and do something that's slightly um, off the wall, but slightly um, common sense if you like. So what I thought is let's imagine we're doing a building project. So we're, our job is to build or our project is to build 250 houses in the south of England. I thought we'd go in the south of England because if we're in the north of England everyone thinks that it's nothing but building in the south of England and if we're in the south of England you pretty much think the world revolves around the south of England. So I thought it would meet everybody's expectation. If you're offended by that I apologise, I meant it purely as tongue-in-cheek. So we're in a building project de delivering 250 houses to the in the south of England. We've got the design, we've got the architect plans, and we've even got a contractor ready to start the build. So we've gone through IP. We're, we're beyond initiating the project, or we're at the point of initiating the project. Project. We're waiting for authorization to go to, to stage two, if you prefer. However, just before we get to that point, we should be thinking about, um, well, what happens to the build site once it's finished? And, and who's going to look after that site then? In fact, just as important, who's going to look after the site during the build? Because it's going to be built in stages. It's not all going to be built at the same time. So who's going to look after the site whilst we're building it? Who's going to maintain the site once we've left? Who's going to do all that support, all that guarantee, the snaggings list and all that? So who's going to do that? And actually, who's going to support and maintain the site whilst we're using it, whilst it's being built on? And who's going to take control of the day-to-day -day activities? And actually, most importantly, when will they take control? Will they take control when all 250 houses are finished? I would suggest not. I would suggest that perhaps they will take control as each tranche is released for sale. So after each 10 or each 20 or whatever it happens to be, someone, some team, somebody's got to look after the new homes, the roads and the utilities as the other stages of the project are being delivered. So if you think about it, we've got the project to actually deliver the houses, but we've also got the support, the maintenance and the control of the day-to-day -day of the houses that are being built. And as I say, we don't start the project and then throw 250 houses over the wall. Because let's face it, the developer would have gone out of business by then. They want to sell as they are going. Because if they can sell, okay, they want to sell from the plot. But if not, they want to sell the finished houses. They want people to be moving in and living in the houses. So they want to release that capital as they're going. So the project management and the service management and the service management happen simultaneously. So, we've got a clear idea of what's being built. We're going to build 250 houses. So, therefore, we've got a clear product description. 250 houses. We've got the acceptance criteria. They've got to, they've got to have roof. They've got to be safe. They've got to be um, complete. They've got to be you know, draft-proof and, and, and to, the, to the customer's criteria. We've got a business case. We want to make some money, obviously. We've got a budget we've got to work to. And in our ITIL world, we have what's referred to as the service charter. 
This is what goes into service design. What is in service design is the architect's plans and, and who's going to be building them ready to start. Now, we've already said we've got the design, the architect's plans, and the contract ready to start. So effectively, we've created the PID or the service design package. Now, you guys who use project management know that the PID isn't finished until the end of the project because we add to it and we review it and we amend it as we're going. It's exactly the same from the service design package. So until it's actually live, until all the problems are being ironed out, until we've uh, made sure that it's signed off, the service design package can, til can still be added to. Now this is done by your project manager, if you're in Prince2, or in the ITIL world, by a process referred to as design coordination. Their job is to make sure all of the design activities come together in the same way as the project manager's responsibility is to make sure that all of the, the activities to deliver the products, products for that stage are completed. So from an ITIL perspective, this design coordination is looking at things like availability management, capacity management, information security management, service level management, and supplier management. Now, okay, in your uh, projects, you might not need all those, but if you're doing an IT project, you're definitely going to be thinking about redundancy and resilience and uptime, and that's what availability management is about. You're definitely going to be thinking about whether you have sufficient capacity to run the service, or sorry, to deliver the service at the point of uh, release, at the point of sign off, and potentially your project might be targeted with making sure that they are future proofing the service for a gear or the products for a given period of time. So you need to be doing capacity management, making sure we have the right capacity in the right place at the right time, thinking about capacity of the future as well as capacity now. Okay, in our little building site example, we wouldn't have information security management, but we would have security management, we'd have site security management. If we're talking about an IT project rather than a building project in this case, then actually we need to be thinking about who has access to information and data and knowledge and at what point in time. When should they have access to permissions and all that sort of stuff? Well, that's what the project manager should be thinking about. But equally so, if I'm the person who's going to be handing out the permissions to the users at the end, I want to be involved in that discussion. I want, don't want to just be given jobs that I have to do, I want to be involved in that. I want to know that I'm going to be asked to do that so that I can plan the right resources, I can plan the right teams, I can plan the workloads. Equally so, going back to our silly building thing, the service level management, right levels of service, service level agreement, operational level agreement. If I'm a new person buying the house, I want to know how long my house is guaranteed for. I want to know that the roads are going to be kept clean. I want to know that the um, utilities are going to be connected and the utilities are going to work and, and how quickly it gets fixed. We've all been, I'm sure, in that situation, if you have ever lived in a new, new, um, a new build where you have problems and, and, and maybe I'm wrong here, maybe, but certainly it's been my experience where you then try and order something online and your postcode doesn't exist. And everything relies on all our deliveries rely on postcodes these days. And it's that sort of stuff that service level management will get involved with, as well as supplier management. I mean, if the utilities are being delivered, let's say our broadband or whatever is being provided by Virgin, or it's being, or cables provided by Virgin, or the infrastructure is being provided by BT or whatever, we need to make sure that when our buyers buy their houses, that the suppliers have actually delivered the right level of service. Now, that's part of the project. Of course it is but it's also part of service management because you're going to have to manage the suppliers day on day. So we should get involved at the design areas, at the design stage, so that we can meet, we can get to know the suppliers, we can understand how the suppliers work, they can understand how we work. If we get involved right at the start, then there's really very little excuse at all as to why we can't get involved, uh, sorry, we can't actually deliver it on a day-to-day -day basis in service operation because we already knew what was coming down the pipeline, we already knew what was going to be thrown over the wall because we were involved in those discussions. So having that service management view should mean that not only it makes our projects better, but actually it makes it far easier for our projects as well. So we talked here about as each as once each stage complete, a review takes place. We look at the business case, we look at the risk log. Of course you do in, in 
um, in Prince2. And in service management, we have change evaluation. As I've already mentioned, it's the only time that ITIL ever really talks about projects. Would I, would I suggest they are the same as um, managing the stage boundary with a project board? Well, I'm afraid I would. I think they are. Information and actuals, irrespective of whether you're in Prince2 or in ITIL, are stored in the configuration management system, the CMS. One of the same things. The design, the architects and contractors was ready to start. We've already known that. We've created our PID. We've created our uh, service design package, one of the same things. It's then passed through in our ITIL world into change management who build it and deliver it and test it as part of transition. Or, of course, in print too, that's the project manager delivering uh, team plans to our team managers. Well, Change management is doing much the same thing. Change management doesn't do it. Change management effectively takes on the role of project management at this case. So in reality, they can be, again, one of the same person or one of the same people or one of the same group. They use, in ITIL world, release and deployment to do the building, the testing, and the validation. Well, Prince2 uses our team managers, uses our teams. The output is put into the configuration management system. The output is put into the configuration management system. So it's effectively all doing the same thing. So I don't expect you need to do both because you are doing both simultaneously. So we won't need to say, well, you can be the change man, you can be the change manager, and you can be the project manager, and you can be the change authority, because one person could do the whole lot. I just put a slight um, caveat down the bottom here where you've got the service design package I've got unless errors are detected and corrections need to be made. Uh, in the ITIL world if uh, it, you identify that there are changes that need to be made then you might raise a request for change in the same way as you would do print but in essence um, it's releasing deployments responsibility to make sure that what they are building is what's designed and if there are any issues uh, in that build they highlight it and they make sure that um, it's corrected before it goes live. Um, a bit like a team manager, if it's outside of tolerance, would actually produce an exception report. If it's within tolerance, they produce a checkpoint report. They're doing the same thing. So, products is being built and tested and under Prince 2, as I say, it's under the control of project board or if we need to go, take, go further uh, above that, if you like, we've also got the corporate management. So under the DP process, um, we, can, we can get ad hoc advice at any point in time. In the ITIL world, it's slightly different, but not massively so, because they have functional units. People who are experts in the infrastructure, technical management, people who are um, experts in the application management. Now, that's going to be software in the IT world, software and, and usability. If we're talking about um, the um, building example, then the technical management would obviously be the structural engineers. You might re might refer to those as the bricklayers, um, you know, the people that understand how many roof trusses we need to build a roof, how many, um, you know, how we're going to actually put the, the slates and the tiles on the roof, whereas the application management would actually be the second fit. You know, the people that come in and uh, run, the electric, run the electrics, do the plumbing, do the plastering, uh, potentially even do the, some of the decoration. It depends what you bought from, from your house. So technical management infrastructure, application management are much more uh, focused on what I would refer to as the utility, actually, how the, whether it's fit for purpose, the use of it. And then the day-to-day -day management from an ITIL perspective is run by this operations team. Uh, uh, now, the operations control are all about managing the day-to-day, -day, making sure that the service is delivering what it should be delivering. Now, of course, that is sitting, if you like, outside of Prince 2, because it will already be live by then. However, however, they need to have been contacted and discussed, and they need to, uh, talked to, rather, and they need to be a part of the design and the transition phase, because if you want them to support it, if you want them to monitor it, if you want them to manage it, they do at least need to know what it is that they are being asked to manage, monitor, and look after. Facilities management in the ITIL world are purely about buildings. Now, that does differ in, differ in Prince2, but of course, that again would just be a team manager. And the service desk in the ITIL world is about having a single point of contact. If we go back to our silly um, example 
of the house building, if you bought one of the first houses, who do you contact if you've got a snaggings list? Who do you contact if you are cross that the road is muddy when you're trying to get to work? Who do you contact if the cement mixer is blocking your way to your driveway or whatever it happens to be? The single point of contact. In our house example, all of these functional units could be specialists, areas of specialists. So if we're thinking about it from a project perspective, structural engineers, suppliers, specialist groups, you know, you might identify bones or, or historic features, in which case we need to get the archaeology archaeological groups involved. We might be building uh, um, green uh, uh, greenhouses or whatever, so on the roof we're going to have to put solar panels. Well, I don't know anything about solar panels, so we need to get somebody involved who knows about solar panels. I can put in my project plan, we need to put solar panels on the roof, but that doesn't mean I need to know how many panels need to go on, on each and what the wiring requirements are. Of what. So we need to get those guys involved. And of course, they need to be involved at the design phase. They need to be involved in the transition phase for the um, commissioning of the solar panels. And of course, they would also need to be involved in the operations bit because presumably if we bought the solar panels from them, they will be a three, five, ten year life um, guarantee that goes with those solar panels. And therefore, they need to be involved um, in the support of that. So again, service management, and project management, Prince2 and ITIL working together to deliver the final product to the work specification defined and then in a way that is able to be supported longer term. So, as we've already mentioned and as I've already mentioned, what happens if some of the build is finished, but not all of it is, been, is finished? Well, in ITIL, we're using release and deployment. In, Pro, in Prince2, you're using the project, the, team, the teams. Yeah? At some point, we have what ITIL refers to this as early life support. You know that bit in the project where, well, you've kind of finished, but you haven't finished. You've finished some of it. That, that actually some bits are being used, but you might, in your world, you might be talking about them. Well, it's in pilot or it's got, we've got a few super users using it. It's not, it's not finished, but it is finished enough for them to be testing it and doing the final user acceptance testing. Um, it's sort of live because it's in the live environment, but it's not actually a live service that's being supported at the moment. It's not in our service catalog or anything like that. It's, it's, do you know what I mean? That, that little area in between, that in between where it's not quite live, but it's, it's sort of out of the project. Now, in the ITIL world, that's referred to as early life support. And in the ITIL world, it's service operations that would look after that. But they know what they're going to get. They know that we are leading towards getting to, to sign off because they were involved all the way through. They were involved in defining the service acceptance criteria. They know from service design what they were getting. So in, in PRINCE2, we are doing all of this potentially um, as we are fast approaching the final stage. Although you might argue that actually if you've got a management stage that is user acceptance or you've got a management stage that is pilot, that actually your, your project might run for another three months, six months, a year or whatever whilst it, it's being handed over. My argument would be at that point, why? Why are you using that expensive project resource to do that? surely we could be passing that into service management at that point in time. So, so now we've finished some of the building, people are living in there. So we've still got to be doing, answering those questions. Those questions which were, Who's going to look after the site? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to take control? Who's going to get, you know, who's going to look after it day to day? And this is without doubt where the balance tilts more towards ITIL and further from Prince. So Prince 2 starts to back off as the project is coming to its end. As we enter the, close, uh, the closure, of the, you know, the final stage and we're moving towards closure of the project, then ITIL definitely steps up because in the ITIL world, we have this service operation, the bit that actually looks after the day-to-day, -day, and Prince doesn't have that. 
So Prince 2 is, is, is helping us deliver the project um, and certainly we've got service strategy, we've got service design and we've got service transition involved. Service operation though is very much about day to day, very much about ITIL. However, again, if we haven't been involved in the design, in the transition, in the strategy, we go back to that picture of the man catching the ball. We don't know whether it's going to be a bowling ball. We don't know whether it's going to be a tennis ball or a, a, a ping pong ball or whether it's going to be the bomb. We should do because if we've been involved all the way through, then we would have a very clear understanding of exactly what's being delivered and therefore we can underpin the fact that both project management, PRINCE2 and service management, ITIL, are all about delivering the business value. If we're not delivering value to the customers, then from an ITIL perspective, we say, what the hell are we doing it for? From a PRINCE2 perspective, if we're not even close to delivering value to the customers, then why are we continuing with the project? Let's end the project early. Or close to use the right the right um, phraseology. So, nothing happens perfectly, nothing ever goes right, doesn't matter how well you run a project, it's never going to be perfect. Well, if it is, I take my hat off to you, you're a better person than I, and I, quite frankly, um, thank you for your time, but you, you've clearly got it all sorted. In truth, nothing really ever runs perfectly. So going back to our silly building idea, I've talked about snaggings. There are always going to be things that could have been done better. There are always going to be things that maybe just hang over after the project. Now that's why Prince2 has the follow-on actions recommendations. Yes, of course it does. And ITIL does a similar thing, except they have continual service improvement, and they have what's referred to as the continual service improvement register. A list of opportunities to improve with a recommendation as to whether they should be followed. Whereas Prince 2 has got the following action recommendations, a list of actions that could be taken to make uh, the final delivery better, uh, the final um, product better, um, faster, cheaper, or whatever it happens to be, and the recommendations as to what should be done and when it should be done. Almost one of the same thing. So we find ourselves in this final stage. We're closing the project. We're going to deliver the following actions report, or if we're in idle world, we're actually in our early life support. We should be identifying improvement opportunities. If we're identifying improvement opportunities, then somebody needs to make the decision as to which of those uh, improvement opportunities we act or, or follow on action recommendations we are actually going to do. And that is either the senior user if you're a Prince2 person or potentially the service owner if you're a service management person. They might be different people, but I would argue if you're doing it really well, uh, potentially they're going to be one of the same person. The bottom line is that they are accountable for the delivery of the service to the customers, making sure that the end-to-end -end delivery of the service is exactly as the strategic people asked for, or if you like, corporate or program management asked for, and that the project board ensured that the project manager delivered in his project. In the ITIL world, the service owner is there to make sure that the end-to-end -end service is delivered as defined in the service design package. So, both ITIL and PRINCE have a very, very heavy focus upon value and what value is, and the value to deliver the services to the customers. In PRINCE2, there's a review of quality each stage boundary. In ITIL, you're doing it as part of continual service improvement all the time. So in ITIL, you're talking about doing it at each stage. Oh, well, actually, that's what PRINCE2 says each stage, isn't it? Uh, you look at each checkpoint and highlight a point and say, this is what we could do better. This is what we could have done faster. This is what we could have done cheaper. These are the lessons we've learned. This is what we did well. Are these not the same? Because ultimately what we're trying to get to is going from something that's just kind of highly committed to actually being the winner, the, the best we can be, the best of breed. So just before I finish, because I do appreciate that we, we're three quarters of an hour done now, just before I finish, could you do me a favour and, and just to see, and please don't, don't feel that you're in any way being uh, manipulated to do this, I just want to ask the question that we asked you right at the start again. So in your view, when does ITIL start and when does PRINCE end? 
could you, Maria, if you could put that poll up again, please, could you just ask um, question three now, which is the same as question two. I just want to be aware of the, the hundred or so people that have listened to me for the last half an hour or so. Has your perception changed? Has, has, we, have we now got a point where you, more of you think, and, and please be honest, if you, do, if you don't think it has changed at all, put exactly the same answer. But I just, just as an aside, I'd be interested to see whether things have changed. Excellent. Hopefully you've done that, and Maria will be posting me the the answers imminently if she hasn't already done so. Oh, excellent. So there's a fundamental change then between people who think that that um, ITIL passes it to to that, and, and I don't need to do the maths, I can do the maths myself in my head. So thank you very much indeed. So actually, the vast majority of you now see that they are working simultaneously. So brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you for, for humouring me in doing that, that poll. I, I do appreciate that. So just to finish, just to finish, before I pass you on to, to Ben, because I know we've got about five or six minutes left. Um, can we continue to, to function using Prince2 and ITIL as separate entities? Yes, of course you can. Uh, there's nobody going to say that's wrong. However, I do hope that just even this half an hour just made you think, actually, if we combine both ITIL and Prince2 together, then actually what it's going to do is it makes the deliverables far easier and it will make the, the um, supporting teams and the project teams, both stronger, better, and more effective. And my last parting gift, if you like, gift is, is inverted commas, very heavily in inverted commas. Um, humanity is looking to explore Mars. So it's looking to send people to live. So we're looking to explore Mars, sending people to live there. How can we possibly plan and execute that project, that mission, without a substantial involvement with the people who will ultimately be supporting the people who are living on Mars? We can't just provide a rocket. We can't just sort the people out. We've got to think about the whole thing. How are they going to live? How are they going to support each other? Because if we want them to be successfully uh, procreating or mining or whatever it is that they're looking to do on Mars, we need to be thinking about how they're going to be supported. That needs to be built in within the project right at the start. You could use both, you could use both uh, process, uh, the methodology and the framework separately, both approaches separately. But if you use them both together, the chances of success increase massively. And we should be very successful in that mission. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Um, I'm going to stop at this point, but I am going to ask you, if you have any questions, could you just jot down the questions, put those questions in the chat box? Whilst I'm doing that, and I appreciate I'm a bit short of time, so my apologies to Ben up front because I've stolen some of his time. So, so apologies, Ben. Ben, my colleague from ILEX, is just going to talk to you because we do have some uh, course information for you, uh, and I believe he's even got a, a special offer to, to offer to you guys who have taken the time to spend uh, 45 minutes with us. So if there are any questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. Maria will collate those, and we can come back and discuss those afterwards um, if you have any. Um, in the meantime, Ben, I'm handing the baton over to you, sir. Please feel free to uh, take it from me and speak whenever you choose. Paul, well, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting presentation. I'll, I'll let you off for stealing a couple of my minutes. As you may well know I, I like to talk quite a lot about Prince 2 and ITIL. Um, it was a genuinely interesting presentation, and uh, as Paul mentioned there, we actually have some uh, not only some 
course information just coming up on the next slide, but also a very special offer which we have running um, for the next kind of 24 hours or so. Um, to start with, uh, we went through a poll at the beginning, um, and it looks like the majority of people on the uh, on the webinar are looking at either Prince2 or ITIL or, or kind of a combination of the two. And from that, we actually have a variety of options that you can become um, certified in both the methodology and the framework at the same time. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide. There we are at the top. We have the Prince2 learning options, which can be delivered through a face-to-face -face classroom engagement, through our e-learning, our accredited e-learning, or a blend of the two. Now these start from £299 and uh, can be delivered almost anywhere in the country. As you can see, um, we have our public classes available there. Um, for a corporate approach, um, these can be done anywhere in the country or indeed anywhere worldwide in, uh, in the corporate offices of, of any of our clients. Similar approach for ITIL Foundation. Um, purely from the fact that it's, uh, the foundation is just one level, it's either the classroom option or the e-learning option. Um, again, £299 start. Um, we have public courses running in London, Nantwich and Bristol, so Nantwich is up in Cheshire. And then for the ITIL kind of higher levels, um, well, a variety of the higher levels, either through the life cycle or capability pathways, as well as the managing across the life cycle, the prices start from £1,040. The options for that are in London, although as I mentioned with the corporate program, we can run that anywhere in the world. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, we have a special offer running at the moment, which is going to come up on the next slide as well. Um, so, as you can see there, if you purchase ITIL Foundation or Prince2 Foundation e-learning course by midnight tomorrow, you will get a full 10% off that course if you use the, co the code that's shown there. So ITIL P2015. That's available until tomorrow night at midnight. Um, now, the best way to get in touch with us is shown there. So it's www.ilxgroup.com. Our uh, telephone number is 01270611600. Or for either of the different types of inquiries you have, either myself or my colleague Nadia's email address at the bottom there for you. So it's Nadia Yahya. Or myself, Ben Green, if you're a corporate inquiry, if you're looking for an organizational requirement, I'd be more than happy to have a quick chat with you and, and work out the best way to work it out for you. Um, and with that said, very, very brief introduction into the ways in which you can become certified. Hopefully the questions have come flooding in and, uh, and I'm going to pass it back over to Maria and Paul who will then be able to address some of those questions that I'm sure have um, appeared. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. Um, yes, uh, I suppose I ought to be, be efficient and go back to the, the any question slide. Uh, we've had a question and, and a comment come through and I think um, but the question's easy and, and the comment's a fair one. Uh, the comment's coming, that although the project board and the CAB are similar, project boards still have much influence and executive buy-in. Uh, and I don't know whether there was anything more, more on that message, but, but I, I wouldn't disagree with you, except I would say um, it very much depends at, to what level you have CAB and where CAB is. Um, from my change management perspective, I would definitely make sure that we have um, somebody um, with sufficient influence from the organization, from the executive, e.g. representing the customer on the CAB, uh, defining each each change request so that the cab doesn't become too IT focused and too buried in the detail but actually is uh, an advisory board to help the the change authority make the decision and, and effectively the cab could work at um, an executive level at a senior board level at steering group level um, as well as the day-to-day -day detail level so um, it's a very fair point and I wouldn't argue with with what you've put there um, at all, um, I th um, it's a fair point. No argument. Um, two other questions around the 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 um, exam itself. Um, um, what are the exam bodies for both Prince Two and ITIL? Um, ILX generally use an organisation called PeopleCert. Um, PeopleCert is, uh, I have to say, an ex is a very fast and upcoming um, exam body. Very efficient. Um, get really good, quick results. Good, clean papers. Um, I've, I've used them many, many times, and we've never had an issue at all. They're very easy to approach. But that's not to say that there are they are the only exam body. There are a number of other exam bodies that will offer both 
Um, as I say, ILEX generally use people search, but there are um, APMG is the um, other exam body that most people know because APMG used to have um, total control over um, ITIL and PRINCE2 and all of the exams and stuff um, before um, Axelos took over control of it. Um, so APMG may see um, some of their control uh, diminish, but APMG are still probably a, um, a major player in, in relation to the exam bodies. And there are others too. There is um, exam bodies called um, um, Exin and Loralist, and there are a number of others. But, but fundamentally, ILEX use PeopleSearch. Oh gosh, loads more coming. How would you design the transition from ITIL and PRINT2 as separate disciplines to combined? How would you design the transition from ITIL and PRINT2 as separate disciplines into a... Oh right, okay. Um, I understand the question now. Um, for me, how would, you, how would you move the transition uh, from ITIL and PRINT2 as separate disciplines into a combined approach? Um, I would fundamentally focus upon tra the transition bit itself, actually. Um, so I would start by um, having our CAB meetings or our CAB presentations, whatever you want to call, maybe getting some of the project. I've certainly done it myself for real. You end up getting the project managers to actually come and do a demonstration, demonstration presentation, whatever you want to call it, um, of their project to the CAB members. So the CAB are aware of what projects are doing and then they can help make decisions or help the change authority make decisions around uh, what changes should be accepted from a day-to-day -day basis knowing what the projects are also doing. I would also insist upon the um, project managers updating the change schedule which is one of the outputs from change management. So I would definitely do that. I would also be very resistant if I'm honest as to um, allowing senior users to be um, identified who weren't part of the, the, the service management area. So I would try, if you haven't got it now, to, I would be trying to influence the choice of, serv of senior user as being more and more um, um, service management orientated. Bearing in mind, of course, that you don't have to have one, you could have multiple. And even if your service management um, activities are outsourced, we could still have those as senior users or even just use them as project assurance. So I would start I would start by using the pivot point um, um, in um, transition. Um, how do you register for foundation exams uh, for courses? You just need to talk to your account managers at ILX and they will work with you. Are there multiple bodies for which to select? Uh, are, there are multiple bodies which one to select for the foundation exam. Um, the bottom line is that they all provide the same exam that APMG currently ho hold. So PeopleCert, Loyalist, um, and all of those um, actually book their exams, as it were, through APMG. So, or Sorry, book the wrong word. License their exams through APMG. So they are all of the same. So there is no easier foundation exam or harder ex foundation exam because effectively they are all using the same exams. I think that probably covers all of the questions that people have asked. So I hope that I have done that, and I hope that I've done it in the one minute. So thank you very, very much indeed for your attendance. Um, thank you all for your time. Um, if um, I have the pleasure of meeting any of you at either a Prince 2 course or a NITAL course, um, then that will be my pleasure. So thank you, guys and ladies. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to spend with us. Um, I hope that you take um, advantage of the offer, and we'll see you in an ILX deliver training course in the very, very near future. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I will sign off now and wish you a very good day.